Hi everyone, and welcome to this mini lecture on what is mass culture theory. This is part. This mini lecture is part of a series that is uh, part of a course called Popular Culture in the U.S., uh, which is a course taught at North Shore Community College. In this mini lecture, we're going to take a look at this idea of mass culture theory, uh, which is largely understood as is the earliest theoretical approach to talking about popular culture. Uh, and so this first one we're going to explore what it is, but then we'll have a few follow-up mini lectures on mass culture theory, talking about problems, looking at examples, etc. So when we look at mass culture theory, the first our origin for this largely comes from a guy named Matthew Arnold, uh, who wrote a book that was basically a collection of, of essays called Culture and Anarchy in 1869. Uh, if you're ever interested, this is actually a book you can get online and take a look at what some of his arguments are. I'll tell you right now, it, it's, uh, these are not lively and engaging texts, but they are, it, it's worth taking a look at. So in this, in this, what we see is kind of the cornerstone of much of popular culture critique. And it's a critique that still is around today, and we hear it all the time. And within mass culture theory, we get this discussion of culture as taste, and that there is a variety of tastes, but the tastes are hierarchical. There are some tastes that are better than others. And the most, you know, the best taste of all, we could say, is the elite culture. And so, Historically, what you see happening is people privileging elite culture as the best taste, as what is good taste. And that creates a hierarchy of, well, what are not so good tastes? And the, the goal within this, or, or the, the approach here, is to privilege that elite culture. Say, this is what everybody should be aspiring for. This is what everybody should appreciate or see as fine. And within that, a, a, a subtler critique of saying not everybody can appreciate it. Not everybody can, you know, fully appreciate elite culture, elite art, because they're not smart enough, they're not good enough, they are wasting their time on other things. So be aware of this. You, like I said, this is something that's uh, it's ever present in modern culture. When people start to rag on reality television or they start to attack uh, video games, there's an element of mass culture theory at work there. It's often saying that culture is not good, it's not a museum. So what ends up happening with mass culture theory is that there's embedded in it is this idea of something that is mass produced has less value. If you can make a lot of it, then it's not worth as much. And again, we see this lots of times when there's, you know, this is part of an economic concept of supply and demand. If you have a lot of something, it's potentially less valuable than if you have a small amount of something, right? This is why gold is supposedly worth so much is because it is it is not abundantly available, whereas plastic is abundantly available, so therefore it's less valuable. And that mass production comes with two, uh, two things create mass production. Ease of reproduction, right? How easy it is, is it to reproduce something? Within popular culture or within culture, you know, that question rises up, how easy is it to reproduce? So what we see is some things are given more privilege than others. Certain types of art, right, painting is considered more valuable than, can't, than, than taking photos because painting is not easy to reproduce at least if you're looking at po paintings that are hand painted. Um, whereas photos, well, yeah, if you have, certainly if you have the original film, you can make a lot of reproductions of it. And then the cheapness of reproduction. So it's not just can it be reproduced, but can it be reproduced cheaply? And so things that can be reproduced cheaply often become less valuable. Certainly film has had this long legacy. Film at this point, you know, there is an argument that has definitely made its way into elite culture, but there's still a sense of it, you know, even within that though, people see most films as being mass culture, right? Easy to reproduce and cheap to reproduce, especially now with digital where they don't even have to reproduce the film, the actual, you know, physical film itself anymore. All they have to do is send the digital file to different places to go onto the projector. So it becomes increasingly cheap. Um, and there's a devaluing in that that we see in, within cultural dialogue. 
So within mass culture, what you see, or within mass culture theory, what you see is there's this idea that authentic cultural products should have the following. They should be singularly produced, right? So typically there should be a singular artist connected to it or of some, you know, an artist, musician, some kind of creator who is making these things one at a time. And it should take time, right? It shouldn't just, hey, you know, three seconds and done, but it needs to take time as opposed to the mass reproduction where, you know, in an hour you could have a hundred books, published, you know, reproduced. Um, in an hour, you could have all sorts of, you know, things remade or, or mass produced. It should require direct human effort. Now, sometimes this gets a little complicated, of course, in the in the in the current age. But you definitely the idea is that some specific person is actually working on this project. It's not just something you can automate, right? So if it's, uh, you know, one of the ideas here is if a robot can do it, you don't have to. So these, these productions also require intele intellect to experience. So you can't just have an intellect to create it, but you need to have intelligence in order to experience this. And this is a, you know, again, this goes into this, uh, you know, into this idea of elite culture that not everybody will have the capabilities to fully appreciate it. And we see this again, if you go into, in, if you go into the, uh, in, into museums, if you go into the theater, that there's this expectation of you need to be of a certain intelligence in order to fully appreciate a certain experience. So the the power of experience is given to a certain population and others are denied to or denied in a sense that they can't fully experience it because they're not intelligent enough we'll see within you know we see within this mass culture theory a lot of critique of the masses and their lack of intelligence and again there's there's lots of questions about that the products should be culturally they, they should contain culturally ordained aesthetics. Now that's a very complicated term and what it really means is taste. The whatever the product is, it should be it should embody the taste of elite culture at that particular time and place. So examples I have up here is the Mona Lisa and the Sydney Opera House. And you know both of these have or both of these embody certain elements of taste of the cultures that produce them. However, mass, produ mass cultural products or anything that is considered a mass produ uh, cultural product is manufactured in large numbers, right? So the idea is that this comes off some kind of conveyor belt. Produced quickly, and by produced quickly, you know, we, we quickly is relative, but here we're talking about, you know, in relation to how singular pieces are made, which can sometimes take years, these things are often made in much quicker time. We're talking it may be days, weeks, or months, but it's still significantly quicker than what we may see in with our with authentic cultural products. Require a passive audience. Now, I have disagreement with this in that I don't think mass cultural products require a passive audience. I think there's a very active audience a lot of times. But what this means, or, or the assumption here is, is that the audience members just sit back and are fed. Um, they're fed the movie, they are fed the pictures, they are fed um, the sounds, and they don't have to work to understand it. I, like I said, personally, I, there, there's problems with this, and we'll take a look at it when we get to the, the critiques of mass culture theory, but this is an assumption of mass culture theory. And contain no, no meaningful worth. They are superficial. Right, and so the idea is that people cannot get any deeper truths about life and the world, and therefore they are again considered they're superficial, they're lacking taste, they're lacking substance. All right, so again, mass culture theory, one where it comes from is this idea that in the 17 and 1800s with the Industrial Revolution, we see this mass urbanization and mass industrial, industrialization occurring. That is, these two forces, ginormous cities and lots of things being produced, 
really disrupted the good qualities of society. And really what, what you hear within mass culture theory is that back then people knew their place. And when you get into urbanization, new places emerge, new roles emerge. It's a very different world for men and women to be living in villages or living in farm areas to be living in cities. You go from, you know, access to the other sex could be miles away to it being right down, you know, right down the block. And what that means for relationships, what that means for how and what people do, what that means for people's opportunities significantly changes. Your opportunities in a city are significantly more than your opportunities in a village. But that scares people. Um, that just you know that makes the elite concerned because the masses are supposed to know their place. We also see, or this, there's also this argument that within this development of urbanization, industrialization, individuals lack moral substance and communal connections. Being in the city means that they're going to go wild, right? And we have all of this mythology about how if you go to the city, you're going to be corrupted. You're going to do sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And this is that concern that all of a sudden, you know, without being exposed to these mass productions, being exposed to this throwaway culture, thus makes people more immoral or makes society more disruptive. Again, we'll talk about this later, but this is this is largely false, um, and we've seen that actually proven over the last 200 years. We've become we've become more moral. We've become more stable as a society. And the idea is that once this starts to happen, you know, once without that traditional society that we see in the 1700s and 1600s, one that's r rural based, not um, city based, society falls apart. And that individuals in a mass society, and the concern here is that the individuals in a mass society are pawns to mass media and popular culture. That is, because they're not intelligent to know the difference between elite culture and popular culture, they become subject and easily manipulable or more likely to commit and do horrible things. They're lacking morals, they're lacking intelligence, you know, the world is going to fall apart because of popular culture or mass culture. So we can kind of understand why Matthew Arnold called his book culture, and there he meant elite culture in anarchy. Without elite culture, you know, if we're left with mass culture, anarchy ensues. So what happens is that democracy and education may actually be bad for society. Uh, what we see in the 1800s is mass, de you know, mass demo democratic uh, practices established throughout the world and with that we also see the increase of education however this is mass produced education this is putting 30 40 50 60 kids in a classroom and teaching them it's not a tutor so again mass production of education starts to raise a question of can these people really be taught now when I'm saying this me personally I don't believe this but this is part of what mass culture theory uh, promulgates. It's, it's part of what its approach is. So ultimately the breakdown of class, status, education, and rights means that the elite class has less control over the many. And that's disconcerting. That's you know certainly breaking with the tradition of thousands of years. And so you know mass culture theory is really a theory of elite culture trying to you know avoid or, or feeling challenged by people that have more means and rights than they ever did before. And again, we still see this today. All right, that's all for now. Thank you very much for listening. I will see you in the next lecture.